Hey guys, BBI here. I want to stop and say thanks thanks for tuning in and checking out whatever the video is about that's about ready to come up next. If you could take a minute and hit subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate it. And if you enjoy what you've seen here, make sure to hit the like button. We'd greatly appreciate your support. Anyhow, guys, all that aside, let's get on with the show. Well, I guess I should start here. I guess I should. Um, we're going to talk about my workbench. And specifically what we're going to talk about today is this. Now you guys have seen me hook up literally thousands of amplifiers to these terminals. And unless you are one of my YouTube video buff pornographers that have had to watch every single thing I've ever done, you guys just know that that's where my 12 volt positive and negative comes from. Um, for the bigger stuff, I had these blocks made, which have got dual arcade feeders to them, but it seems like I never end up using them. I just jam the wires underneath the eyelets and I go for broke. What I don't believe I've ever covered on video is what is attached to these terminals. Um, I know I did a video on this here, on what's attached to these two terminals here. That's the uh, thousand amp uh, mean well switcher supply that I built out of 10 100 amp mean well medical grade switchers. Well, each one of these things has been like a stopgap. Each one of these different terminals. And it's time for me to kind of bring it all into one. Let me step back and let me explain to you what I mean. So <clears throat> there's a combination of two things that are coming together here. We're going to talk about time. We're going to talk about growth. And on many levels, we're talking personally, mentally, and financially. And we're talking about adding on things to the bench. So we're going to say we're going to have ourselves a timeline. Okay, um, let's see here. We're going to go back to 2010. And I want a brand new Sharpie boxes these things. Ain't nothing like a brand new Sharpie. <clears throat> We're going to go to 2010 all the way through to 2020. Okay. This is our present date of making this video. There's been a lot of growth in a lot of different fields since 2012 or 2010 to 2020 and like huge monumental growth that I don't think a lot of you guys really quite recognize a groundbreaking some of the the technology that we have today to give you an example in 2010 we had the lease that was the biggest alternator you could get that was reasonably acceptable in price it was 350 amp and at that time that alternator was around a thousand bucks and it was huge well the lease had been around forever now Lexadyne's got bigger alternators I know that but they were all incredibly expensive okay so now we fast forward 10 years later and in 2011 this company called ITT Cruxus well, I, not ITT, like Technical Institute, but there, there's a research division called ITT. They developed an alternator that was 1,000 amps at idle, 500 RPM idle. And uh, it could produce like 2,500 amps at 3,000 RPMs, roughly. 
Okay, I'm just giving you an example though in power. So this that technology was starting to come online, but the, the least Neville 350 amp had been the mainstay for well, most radio and car audio guys going back decades before that. Nobody had really, really looked at that design since the 70s. Well, fast forward to today, you have an 850 amp at idle, cold, Mechman, okay, alternator, and the price isn't really quite set in stone on those, they're still selling, but you know, you're looking at about four to five hundred bucks, six hundred bucks somewhere there. So we'll say six hundred dollars. So in ten years we went from our biggest alternator that we could commercially buy and, and be available to the public. The Cruxus that I was talking about here was a military contract only. It's designed to go directly into a Humvee and oh by the way, um, it's gear drive. At least the first versions of it were. So it means it had to be attached to the flywheel of the engine so it's like a PTO takeoff. <clears throat> To an alternator that is small enough to drop into the stock location of your vehicle, at least on most Chevy small block motors, and produce 850 amps cold alternator for $400 less and a third the size. Believe me, this will all make sense to you here shortly. So now here comes little old me. Little me, right down here. And around 2006, 2007 is when I decided I'd come back to the radio world <clears throat> and come muck around with this stuff again. And I really didn't kind of come into a, an, an entity until around 2010 as in like, okay, I'm going to actually start doing this for more than just the local people. So this is our curve of growth, where if you look at the cost versus the amps that are being produced, You'll notice that our amp production has gone through the roof and our cost has continuously dropped. So what I have here is a throwback. All of this is a throwback. Why? Because it all starts with one power supply. All the way back in 2010. My first power supply was an Astron. We'll say start date. First power supply I had was an Astron. 75 amp. That's where I started from. Whole whopping 75 amps. Can you remember back in the day a 75 amp Astron? Man, those were like $300, $400. Big iron core, 25 volt, Astron power supply that they'd regulate down. You set your cap voltage at 15.5, okay? Ended up getting one of these for around 100 bucks, way back when, and I thought I was just top tits. Well, very quickly, I figured out that that little power supply wasn't gonna be enough. So we didn't have any of the neat things that we're going to get ready to bring into play here pretty quick um, just in 10 years ago. So I get my first battery for this. And I already had a truck full of batteries. A truck that had 12 batteries in it for my car audio stuff. But I knew that if I put these two together, Astron plus battery, I could use the battery as a little bit more of a buffer. But still that buffer is only good to 12 volts. Well, I built my first two pill, and a little, little Astron kept up with that. And by about 2010, 2011, all of a sudden I have people showing up with four pills. And every once in a while, if I got lucky, there would be like a 16 pill that showed up. Well, at the same time, this is when I start building my own truck and I get myself a 16 pill and I'm like, I was just testing stuff in the bed of the truck because I already had the car audio stuff in there with the 12 batteries and the four alternators around the motor for the, the car audio system in my white truck, which you guys have all seen that video, the tips and tricks on how to do installs, which is way out of date now. <laughs> that was only a few years ago. That white truck, I still have it, although I'm getting ready to pull everything out of it and sell it because I haven't driven it in almost three years. <laughs> it's just, I don't, not interested in doing it anymore. So here come 2011, 
I got me another Astron. And I made them so that they were linkable. So now I have a total of 150 amp total supply underneath my workbench and I'm into it for, if I was to go buy it off the shelf for roughly a thousand bucks with one battery. So then we're really starting to work on things over here. And the YouTube channel has got like maybe three subscribers to it, basically. I swear to God, I think it was my three or four ex-girlfriends and like a dog in Indonesia. So now we're in 2012 <clears throat> and we're actually starting to really crank out things for people. Meanwhile, what comes along in this amount of time up here pie in the sky is the LED switcher. The great folks in China figured out how they can make switch mode power supplies for dirt cheap and we're bulk dumping them into the market for consumers, I guess would be the best way to put it. And that's all, that all kind of took place around 2012. Okay, so around 2012, 2013, somewhere in here, That's when people started building a bunch of big switcher supplies where they would take 10, 20, 30 of these things, put them in an aluminum cabinet with very minimal amount of breakers, very minimal amount of switches, meters that they bought off eBay. That whole market started to just boom. And when I mean the market started to boom, these, this is a 30 amp, 12 volt, well, maybe 20 amp, <clears throat> 12 volt supply. And guys started getting inside of these things and hacking them to make them do whatever they wanted to. And that happened roughly 2013, 2014-ish, somewhere in this little span of time. The switch mode supplies became very cheap. You guys figured out how to gain them or chain them all together. And so that was the hot thing. You had to have the LED switcher supply and still that at that time was I mean Christ I was still working for the other tow company at that time and I was working only well I used to joke I'd say there's 256 hours a week and 210 hours of that week I was disposed of the tow company some weeks I worked a, a slow week for me would have been 90 hours a week and a busy week would have been like 120 and I got really good at living off of three and two and three hours worth of sleep and I was running myself into the ground meanwhile I was still trying to get the the amp thing out here to go so and you know I've been dating a lot which is another giant suck of money in this period of time and honest to God the current that come out of these terminals wasn't all that important to me I just needed to have enough to make it run on a workbench and that's about the time I started doing the three bird meters and the YouTube channel started to explode a little bit. And I ended up getting a little bit more work and a little bit more work and the projects got bigger. Well, unlike most, I didn't ever take any of the money that was made out here and put it in my pocket. I put it back into the business and I bought more bird meters. Yes, master. Right. And I bought more electronic equipment and I bought more tools and I bought more soldering irons and I continued on that arc because I wanted to grow this thing, but I recognized that I needed to have, you know, seven to six thousand dollars worth of radios. I needed to have five or six thousand dollars worth of bird meters on the benches. I needed to have all these different things that I didn't have. I mean, I started out on an oil can dummy load, which I still got sitting over here in the corner. This is my first dummy load. I made this thing swell up like a basketball once. And when it cooled off, it sucked completely back in. The bottom of it was all cupped out. <laughs> Me and my friend Paul, we were at the old house in the old shop, totally dinking around. We had this uh, Badger four tube amplifier that we were making do like 4,000 watts. And we thought that was a lot of power back in the day. Around here it was. But this is what I was putting it into. <clears throat> and I had a single bird meter. Okay, so we've come a long ways from this to what we have going on today. 
we're going to put this little curve in here to show you work growth that happened around here. In 2015, <clears throat> I built an amplifier called Frankenstein's Spine. Well, when I took on that project, um, I told my friend Epo, I said, bro, I can build you the amp and I'm pretty sure it's going to work. The only way I have to test it is in my truck. And he goes, what? And I said, yeah, I just don't have enough power supply on the workbench to run that thing on the workbench. And I don't want to show it hanging out of the ass end of my truck to run the thing on video. That just looks tacky. And he goes, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, <clears throat> I got to build a power supply or have enough ampacity on my workbench to be able to run that. Well, two things happened from that. I, I, I went out and I tackled it, as in like I, I had to throw more stopgap at it. But after that video came out, um, everybody and their brother tuned, tuned in and checked that out. It got like 47,000 views in a month after that video. Just exploded. Nobody had ever seen anything like that before. But what I didn't show on camera is the stuff that was going on in the background. Me, I'm frank freaking out because I got to figure out how to come up with six, seven hundred, eight, eight hundred amps worth of storage on the workbench, um, <laughs> or how I powered it, or any of that stuff. I had I had to make do to make do to make do. Also, did this thing where I built at the same time. I built a three hundred amp power supply with one custom made transformer from EPD in it with a server cabinet. And it looked really cool. I thought it looked really cool and it worked great. So with two things, I was able to do that video, two things. I had built this power supply for another company or for another customer and, and I'd gone out and purchased a shit ton of batteries. I'm coming from the car audio side of things, right? <clears throat> I paid a lot of money for that one committed transformer. I mean, a metric ton of money for that, that one 300 amp transformer that really was like about seven or 800 amps after we got done testing it we could I've never we never did find the bottom of that power supply we hooked 48 pills and my 64 pill to it and it finally the 64 pill the thing was like uh, you know it that amazing transformer from EPD but um, after that my workload got incredible over here all of a sudden I didn't have enough room to put anything because people were sending me stuff from all over the place to get it repaired. So I kept reinvesting that money. But the very first thing I did in this time frame, I can't remember where in this time frame, it's not really all that important, I said, well, I built myself a battery bank. Now the question you're all asking yourselves is, so what? Well, this is what I used. This is what I was familiar with in the car audio days. <sighs> This is a Hawker, made by Hawker, and then this particular model is Acor. This, this particular style of battery might look familiar to you. Um, the way this is sold to the civilian world is through a company called Odyssey. <sighs> this is uh, an AGM battery. It's a glass mat battery, basically. And what they mean by that is you got lead plates with um, a semi-cloth permeable membrane that sits in between the lead plates and your acid solution is suspended in that cloth or glass mat and it is a non-spillable battery. This is mostly lead. Okay. Well, I bought six of these and tied them together in this huge battery bank that's been down over here, down this way, down here, underneath the bench since 2014. I bought these as reconditioned batteries, which means that these batteries faithfully served our United States military for four and a half years before they were timed out, um, gobbled up by a company here in town called Sterling. Sterling took them, brought them back to their shop, washed them, then proceeded to charge them and then put them on a load tester. Well, it was a good stopgap program for me on my side of the street. 
With that 300 amp power supply in parallel with the battery bank as a buffer between the two, I was able to continue on. And I did the Frankenstein spine video. Well, I went ahead and delivered the power supply to the customer. And so I go out and I buy yet a third linkable Astron. my third linkable Astron. So I need more amperage, I just keep clicking on another Astron power supply. Meanwhile, I've got these six batteries sitting on a custom made wood tray over here, all meticulously linked together with aught gauge wire. I didn't have a hydraulic crimper back then. I didn't think about soldering eyelets back then, but they've all got heat shrink on the eyelets. The eyelets are all crimped in a vise, not appropriate and not good crimps, but it was, it was put together better than most of the connections that I see come in this shop, honest to God. This is about the time also when Mr. Black Productions comes into play. It's all in this window of time and things took off. So my power supply situation here on this workbench has not changed well, at all since four years ago when I built the 1000 amp switch supply. Now in that time, there has been a lot of new innovations that have come along. This is about the time that uh, me and Mr. Black get together and he tells me that he recognizes that my power supply underneath my workbench is woefully inadequate. And I agreed with him. So we went and we researched the best switchers in the market. And at that time it was mean well. Um, today they're incredibly overpriced for what they are. Um, in five years they went from an industry leader to being second or third tier on the shelf. It's amazing what happens when you get a product that everybody wants you don't have the capacity to produce it and then a lot of companies come along and they copy your technology and they ramp up the ability to produce it but then they take your technology and they grow on it meanwhile you stay stagnant just saying that's what happened meanwhile but the thousand amp switcher even after it was all said and done realistically can only produce about 800 amps worth of current before we start having voltage drop so up until today's date I've been alternating back and forth um, depending on what it is that I need to actually have on the workbench powered I've been alternating between this whole mess here bats plus power supply and then from this point forward I can alternate over to the switcher Well, some of the projects that I've been building here lately, like um, the one that I did a couple of years ago now, the 48 pill, like if I came out here and tried to run my 64 pill on a workbench, I wouldn't have enough poop in my shorts to power it. I wouldn't. So now we're going to fast forward to current date. This is where we have stayed. Now my workload increased to its maximum from this point going forward up to current date because there's only one of me here. And I can't seem to find anybody that's here in town that's overly serious about wanting to learn all the little fine minutia to this nightmare of a job that I could come have work with me. <laughs> so it's all the things in the background that I have support with. Meanwhile, the primary pusher of solder out here is myself. Well, with um, our current global pandemic that's going on, I ask myself a couple questions. Well, if we end up having complete you know, infrastructure collapse, which is incredibly highly unlikely likely from all of this, would I even be able to keep all my food that's in my freezers cold if the power got shut off? And the answer to that question is no. <laughs> power's off, power's off. So we've made some changes there. Um, we now have the ability to live on and off the grid here. But one of the things that I wanted to do 
is in this amount of time from 2010 to 2020 most of my batteries which are now 10 years old and have been let's face it thoroughly used um, my battery bank is to the point where it is completely worthless at this point which happens with batteries no matter how you maintain them eventually the battery becomes sulfonated otherwise the acid um, moves out, gets crystallized onto the lead plates inside the battery, and you start losing your ability to have current flow on and off the plates inside the battery. <coughs> Which, uh, yesterday I took a chop saw, a pry bar, a circular saw, um, a sledge maul. It is 11.30 at night. And that is that's the way my phone has been all day. It's non-stop. And I cut the top off of one of those batteries, one of those tank batteries. Oh, God damn. Be quiet. So, I'm going to show you that video clip here in a minute. What we've decided to do is it's time for us to make some serious upgrades to this. Um, we're going to change in the next few days. I'm stopping almost everything over here. And we're going to focus seriously on trying to upgrade this and make this so it's a little bit more palatable for me. Um, it's more modern and that we've got to do this in multiple stages because I got off the phone with my good friends over here at Excess Power. And they're like, well, whatever you want. We'll do whatever we can to help you. Let's do this. Oh, for the love of God. Hold on. Excuse me this a little bit more palatable to me okay um, all the little stop gap things are gonna go away and we're gonna bring this up to what I consider to be um, standard safe okay all the eyelets in here are gonna get hydraulically crimped back filled with solder epoxy heat shrinked um, the power wires that feed up here to the bench are gonna get changed to 4 aught gauge instead of 1 aught we're going to go to 4 aught cable. Um, our bracketing system that we screw into is going to kind of stay the same, but we're going to utilize um, a solid copper plate. So there'll be two plates on here. One's going to be positive, the other one's going to be negative, so we can get um, compression on the wire on both sides. So instead so of just putting pressure on the top with a, a washer, we're going to put pressure on both sides, which is going to allow more current to flow through that connection. Um, the speed and the ease of using the screwdriver to undo and do things is just the flexibility of that's going to stay the same but all the little tiddlywink shit involved with what comes out of that corner of the workbench is going to get drastically overhauled and we're going to capitalize on a bunch of new new technology. So let's talk about that technology again. Once again, I start hearing grumblings around 2015, 2014. I had this friend of mine, his name's Bone Crusher. He's out of Connecticut. Good guy. Him and his, his good friend Donald. Jeff and Donald are good friends of mine. Um, absolute nothing but respect for both of them guys. Super smart gentlemen. Um, Jeff starts telling me about this thing, this little thing. And I thought, man, no way. He starts telling me about these capacitors that... He's seen this YouTube video of this guy starting his car for a year off capacitors. And I was like, no, it's, it's all bullshit. It's got to be all bullshit. That, that, no, 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 there's no way. Everybody in the world, at least in my little sphere of people, are very familiar with this company in my videos about supercapacitors. Okay. Where we started was with this. This is a Maxwell supercapacitor right here. These are the first ones. This is actually the first video, the first capacitor I ever used. I ended up getting it back because we replaced this capacitor with three 
capacitors that had three of e these in them in my in my my friend's truck. That's what's inside each one of these cells. These cells are these individual cells. I've done multiple videos on that. The advantage to the SuperCap tech is your ability to put current in versus its ability to let current out versus the load that is transferred to the vehicle on the input side. We've covered this in multiple videos now. Well, the SuperCap video happened somewhere around, I think, 2016. I think, everybody's going to go Google it now. I think that happened somewhere around 2016. This was a big moment. 2016, somewhere in there. This is a big deal, you guys. This really set us free. This allowed us not to have 21 batteries in our truck. It allowed us not to have to have 15 or eight Lee Snavilles strapped around the front end of our motor to keep our shit going. In the car audio world, supercapacitors started taking over. Over. Batteries were getting thrown out left and right. All of a sudden, you didn't have to weld the axle to the, on blocks and put the, the frame on. You could have an actual ride suspension truck with a big stereo in it. I mean, 64 pills, you could run probably 10 caps and run a 64 pill off of it and maybe two alternators easily. Meanwhile, the alternator price, this 350 amp alternator, now you can get a drop-in variable voltage, external variable voltage, um, 350 amp alternator from McMahon for $500. Cost went down by half, Amp amperage generation stayed the same, and that all happened within this little window in the last 10 years. Well, the other thing that had been in development preceding all of this is this other little thing, lithium batteries. So you have, with all batteries, a bunch of limiting factors. You have inrush, outrush, also commonly expressed as cold, crank, okay, or recharge, and vice versa. rate. Different terms, same thing. For decades, we have been stuck behind the fact that most batteries you can put maybe into, you can stuff into them just a few hundred amps. So we'll say 200 on our inrush or recharge rate, and its ability to dump current is usually only double this, so at about 400 amps. Okay, the other thing that we've been stuck at is the 12 volt slash um, 16 volt slash 24 volt standard. Okay, now how you get to 16 volts is with 3 volt cells or 1.5 volts and adding on to the 12. And vice versa. So now you're going to charge at 18 volts, run everything at 16, so you're going to under alternator the thing, so you're not pushing current up over it when you're underneath the load. We've covered all of that. But still the battery technology has stayed the same. About 200 in, 400 amp, out, amps out. And very, very, very heavy. Okay? Now where our supercapacitor comes in play is to fill the gap. So if you put a thousand amp load on, and we're talking a big truck battery. We're not talking like what's underneath the hood of your little Honda. We're talking a fairly decent sized semi truck battery or like a cat battery. You can pull four or five hundred amps out of that thing and it not totally destroy the battery. You're still putting a thousand amp load. Well, where's the rest of that current come from? It's going to come from your alternators here. Well, with the advent of the supercapacitor, and its ability to dump all the current inside of it itself immediately, 
So you're going to pull from the supercapacitor, meanwhile your alternator is still slowly trickle charging the supercap on the other side with no mechanical extra means, it's just the laws of electricity following themselves. That 100 amp load was getting off shifted to the alternators. So when we got with supercapacitors, now we could have one battery, bat, number of one, and you could have four supercaps. four super caps and you could put this thousand amp load to this particular setup and have one alternator instead of having a complete bed full of batteries. Well that's great. That's awesome. Lead acid. Okay. Lithium. Everybody's got an RC car. I have stacks of them around here. RC cars out my butthole. It's another, it's <clears throat> one of the things that I help keep my brain occupied. LiPo. LiPo batteries are very prone for fires and it's all about the different chemical makeup. Well, in 2010, There are a lot of companies out there and they're chasing the Everest of battery technology. And lithium is gonna be key to where we go in the future in everything. Everything nowadays has got a lithium something side offshoot battery in it, okay? Lithium phosphate, lithium iron, uh, lithium carbon, lithium lithium. There's a lot of different research going on. Uh, the lithium battery technology is what allowed us to make our phones small, make them portable, and make them so that the batteries have thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of complete depletion and full rechargeability. When we were stuck in the land of lead acid, products were big, recharge rates were slow, battery life was bad. With the on-birth of lithium and lithium technology, the voltage number is whatever you want it to be. They make one volt cells, they make 1.2 volt cells, they make 1.5 volt cells, 1.6 volt cells, 2 volt cell, 2.25. Whatever voltage each individual cell you want it to be, there is a company out there willing to coddle your nuts and give them, give that to you in that advantage. The positive upside to your lithium batteries is your inrush. Once again, whatever you want. Okay, your inrush is the same as your output for the most part in theory. Okay. My first real experience was this with with this was when I helped my friend build a mobile power, basically a mobile power wall for his RV. And we bought from, oh, I can't remember the name of the company, they're blue. Everything in that trailer was blue. Big, big company that's big into solar systems for vehicles and or campers and it'll come to me in a few minutes. We bought one of their uh, lithium phosphate batteries but it's got a balancer in it and it's got um, an overcharge cutoff and a temperature regulator and all this other shit that went along with the battery. What I thought was neat that we could literally stuff as much current as the charge controller would put into it, which was a lot, and that we could go and apply like 400 amps continuously on the battery at 1400 amps for an hour and the battery wouldn't drop below 14.5 fully charged was 14.8. But there's a lot of charge restraints that go along with that. Well, some of the new battery tech, which I'm gonna get into in another Vigeo, not this one. Because like I said, this is gonna happen in steps. Everything has to happen in steps, but I am after the, the, the pinnacle of not having to ever not have enough DC current on this bench to run anything I effing want. 
I've got two huge trans transformers coming from EPD. That's gonna be a separate power supply. I'm gonna call that the 2000 amp workbench supply video. That's getting ready to come. They're on their way. And enough with Maxwell. I kind of keep this around as an educational thing or something I can easily throw up on the workbench. I'm not gonna need it anymore past this day, I swear to Christ. Not gonna need it. Since I've partnered with Excess Power, I'm getting 64 of these cells plus the bars and I'm gonna build my own custom supercapacitor bank. Um, I'm not too sure how I wanna set it up yet. <clears throat> But uh, if each super cap has 500 farads, let's see, 5,000, 2,000, 3,000. I want to have at least 5,000 farads worth of capacitance underneath the workbench attached to these terminals at all times. Each 500 farad has 10,000 amps worth of storage capability in it. You guys do the math. We're gonna overcome this voltage dip issue I have, and we are gonna upgrade some stuff around here. Now, because I need to have the ability to have long storage, I decided to do this route. Ugh, this is one of four new batteries. Um, it's kind of interesting. These weren't actually scheduled to be delivered till tomorrow. Um, I ended up purchasing three of these. Um, I had a customer, of mine, a customer of mine, his name is Paul. Um, he's a big super capacitor believer now. He had um, three of these in his truck. I ended up doing some horse trading with him and I got the fourth one from him in a trade deal. And we ended up putting a super, a bigger super capacitor bank. And it's a long drawn out story, but I'm gonna have four of these and these are AGM batteries. We're gonna have four of these underneath the workbench um, in heavy storage. Now I'm gonna have these isolated behind um, a thousand amp um, solenoid. So I can take these out of line. So whatever current that I wanna put into the system is not gonna be focused on charging these lead acid batteries. There's a, there's a power curve that takes place there. Current in rush current maintain load so if you have a 100 amp supply and you've got four batteries that take 50 amps a piece to keep them at 14 and a half volts or 20 20 amps a piece to push that voltage up that extra two volts by the time it's said none you got 20 amps over here that you can use the batteries have drank all that current i want to be able to drop these out if i need to and the way we're going to maintain them is going to be completely different so have four of these, a giant super capacitor bank, and then here in about a month or so, we're gonna have a video about lithium batteries. And excess power, graciously enough, is gonna provide us with some really cool lithium batteries for us to have underneath our bench to maintain, and they're gonna be resting at 15 volts, by the way, resting at 15 volts. Um, they're going to help maintain the super capacitor bank and keep it fully charged. So then anything I add to that bank is going to be supplementary and I'm not going to have the down volt draw of a 12 volt battery and then having to push it up to 14 volts. We're going to be resting at 15 volts, one volt below maximum charge rate for the super capacitors. And then at that time I can bring the thousand amp supply, the switcher, bring it online to supplement the lithium batteries that are going to be backed up with a super capacitor bank. And then for heavy, 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 super heavy, stupid, retarded amp load, we're building this big, giant, uh, non-linear or linear supply. We are making upgrades. So, for us to move forward, the first thing we have to do is take all the old batteries out. Well, that was a challenge. I always wondered what these looked like on the inside, and now I know. I've been drilling and hacking and slashing and chopping. Let me suck this out with R2D2A here. Look at all the sulfonation. Gee, and I wonder why the cells are bad. <laughs> God damn. Well, they sure are a pathetic looking bunch, aren't they? It was impressive when I put it all together way back in the day. 
but uh, these things have come to the complete end of their useful life. It's a shame, but it is what it is. So um, I'm going to load all these up and I'm going to take them off and get the money out of them for their recycled lead weight at 88 pounds a piece. Almost said 88 miles per hour, but at 88 pounds each. So, yeah, we cycled and cycled and cycled these, but after you guys have seen the, the little segment that preceded this, I don't think I'm going to get any more life out of these batteries. They're completely junk, so. All right, well, I'm going to get on with my day, and when I get back, hopefully my, uh, my other two batteries have shown up in the mail, and I will have them with me, and we can get on with getting the workbench put back together so I can get back to work. Woohoo! Well, here we are next day, and we are still waiting for the other couple batteries. It's looking like I'm only going to get one of them in today, so I'm pretty sure this isn't going to make the video, the actual all four batteries. The super caps are on like super retard back order. Let's see where are we at. That'll do. Super back order. What I mean by that is we're probably not going to see them for another month. But with everything in this hobby, it takes time. You got to do one thing at a time. First thing I had to do was get rid of all 12 of them or six of them dead batteries. Now, look, I took them batteries down and I traded them in for scrap weight today. And if I remember correctly, even with the good buddy deal, um, I think I was paying like $200 a battery for those back when. Now, I did get some info from the guys at the battery shop today that the reason the government dropped the contract with Hawker and Acor allegedly has something to do with quality control issues, but I don't know. I don't have first-hand knowledge of that. So probably shouldn't say anything more than that but uh, they claim the all-knowing all-seeing eye oracle of the man at excess power they claim with four of these batterias I can replace six of the other ones and the math works out these are 140 amp hour a piece where the other ones were 100 amp hour a piece so it works the math works I just uh, at a capacitor bank is what's going to slow us up. So around 2016, I started to look to see what it would cost to really start making ourselves um, more of a bulletproof bench. Now, like I left off, around 2016, 2017, um, we started seeing massive in the United States market, but it was elsewhere overseas a bunch was lithiums bats well our amount of amperage that we can draw out of the lithium and shove into it at the same time it almost makes the supercapacitor inert as in like the the benefit the benefits that you get from the super cap of its ability to dump its current and act as a buffer between the electrical load and the source of generation. It almost becomes a trade-off. Um, to me, the supercapacitor should always stand as a buffer between you and your lithium battery. Um, the thing with the lithiums is that they're incredibly small. We're talking 10 pounds, 13 inches long, 5 inches wide, 5 inches tall, roughly, like 4.5 inches wide or something. And they're big in a race car scene because they're so light. I mean, you want to lose 80 pounds of weight in your car? Get rid of your battery and go put a lithium in it. Uh, the charge technology was a little iffy. Um, the cell design was a little iffy, and there was still a fire issue that has, was not addressed until here recently. The new lithium batteries that we're going to be getting from XS 
all of those things have been covered, internally regulated, internally balanced. They're linkable, so you can literally link them so they have communication that goes on between each one of the batteries. So that brings us up to here, up to present, dot, 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 dot. We started out 10 years ago with a single 75 amp Astron. Right? Let me do the math on this, but let's do some hard numbers here. So with four batteries, that's 560 amps that we can apply to the electrical system for one hour before we see one voltage worth of drop. One volt worth of drop. Um, let's see. They're claiming 6,000 amps of cold crank power out of the battery. So 6,000 times six, of course, or times, pardon me, four. 24,000, but of course that doesn't really count because it's going to drop us down to 11.5 or 2 or whatever. The, the cold crank standard is, it varies a little bit. International standard is fixed, but we're not going to dive off that, that diving board because it doesn't mean anything to us. Um, the super caps are where we're going to have our biggest gain. That's 10,000 amps per cap times 6. Uh, that's, you know, 60,000 amps of storage at volt. So I'm pretty sure that no matter what I manage to throw at this, it's going to be able to maintain the strain at 14.5 or 15 volts, wherever I decide I'm going to trim the power supply. The big iron core supply, I'm kind of building it just for fun. I don't think it's necessary, but pretty soon I'm going to have my Astrons up for sale. I don't care where they go, but they can't be here anymore. Not happening in this video, but here pretty quick. That's just a lot of storage and a lot of current and a lot of current that I got to figure out how to deliver right here over here in the corner of the workbench. A ton of current's going to be able to come out of that hole. Now, when I first put this together, um, I had many more batteries and it was a, a big famangled mess, but originally the, the amp rating for that was 1200 amps for one hour at 14 volts DC. Well, pretty quickly I started having cells go bad and stuff go flat and I've just never bothered to change the label. But we'll update that here shortly. Even though I've never, I think I've used, no, I can't say never. I used them on the 48 pill. I used these distribution blocks on the 48 pill. So they've been used once that I can think of off the top of my head on video. Between you and me, I'm kind of thinking about abandoning them and taking them out of, out of there and doing something else with that space. But I think I've created with these four hunks of copper. I think I've come up in my head a way to more smoothly um, with more ability to conduct current uh, better than just an eyelet and some washers on it. I think I've come up with a better connector. I've had friends throw the idea at me that I need to have some kind of wing nut bar where it's quick disconnect with quarter turn and like, oh, yeah, I got, yeah, I got all the time in the world for that. No, I don't. No, I I don't have that technology, but we're going to turn these copper plates into something cool. Now what we're doing with the, the solder pot is once we know, once you, once you deform the copper around our a wire, you are never going to be able to recrimp this again with a hydraulic crimper. So it doesn't matter to me. I, I believe in heresy. I've explained this in many videos. I get around them DIY solar system guys and they their minds start to melt. They're like, oh my God, you solder your eyelids. Damn straight I do, Skippy. It's less resistance. Buck up, buttercup. It's a better way to do things. They like to debate that. There's a single study that was put out by NASA in the 60s, early 70s, and they, they go off the deep end. I've, I've raved and pired on about that in video, and I'm not going to do that again here today. These little bastards are expensive. These thread into the top of the battery, which allows me to use my nice lead battery terminals, because I don't like the look of the nut, and I like to have the wing nut in that, and I want the wires to sit up off the battery, and there's a couple of the reasons I bought these, but these little bastards are expensive. I bought them here locally. I know this, and I say this, and I, I say knowing this, that. I'm sure that I could have gone on Amazon and got them for much less. 
but I literally I need to be done with this. I've got to have at least two batteries underneath there and I got to get this end of the workbench up running before the end of the day. Because right now the computer's off. This is my little video editing suite thing that I got going on. Computer's off and um, these are what's left from the old battery bank. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill these and we're going to submerse solder these in the solder pot instead of heating them up with a torch. And listen to the guys that think I'm, I'm doing heresy. This is a non-vibration prone environment. So therefore we don't have to worry about wear or, you know, vibration fatigue to the wire. It'll be okay, believe me. So instead of abandoning these wires and starting all over, this is good one aught gig cable, um, good copper eyelets. We're gonna submerge solder them and make them purdy, real purdy. And then, <coughs> I can't wait to do this. I love working with 4 aught. It just makes you feel... It's like that shirt. I've seen this shirt for sale on Facebook over and over and over again. Uh, the shirt says, Long range shooting. It's like golf, but for real men. I'm working with 4 aught gauge wire. It's like real wire, but for men. You don't, you don't even want to know how far I got bent over and torn off for four out gauge copper eyelets. Don't even want to know. I'm like, you don't even have the long ones that I can double crimp? No. Do you got the ones that are made from hardened copper and are nickel plated? No. Do you have them with the double eyelets so I can actually maximize the amount of surface area and the amount of current I can get out? No. Still got bent completely over on those. Not happy. But I've got enough positive lead to make it down to where the batteries are going to be stored. And I got enough negative lead to make it down to where the capacitor bank is going to be. Um, I think we're going to have to do multiple one aught gauge runs off the capacitor bank. Probably to a fixed some area that we'll do with a nice, beautiful, custom made copper plate of some sort down underneath the bench. But we're going to have to revisit that in another video. So where we're at today is we're going to do eyelets. We're going to eyelets and reheat shrink, heat shrink and epoxy. We have to manufacture our new attachment points for our workbench, which are going to look remarkably like this when we're done with big fatty, fat, fat, fatty wires attached to the back. So yeah, let's see what we can do. You guys remember Battlestar Galactica from when we were kids? I do. It was a dumb show then, but and them Zylon's heads sure shine pretty. Drink. Drink, my precious. Oh, wire's too heavy. Turn over. Oh. Shinier than the back of a Xilong's dong. That's pretty. That'll take six months to cool off. Okay, so what we're doing here is we've hydraulically crimp this connector perfectly, trim the jacket perfectly, and then we drill this little weep hole in the top to backfill that with flux. Now the whole idea behind this is to solder this portion of the eyelet. I'm not concerned about getting contact down in here. The crimp, and what I mean down in here is I mean specifically this lip. I'm not interested in soldering back this direction too awful bad. It doesn't mean anything to me. This is in a non-vibration environment. It's going to be secondarily supported with heat-based, epoxy-based heat shrink, which will stiffen this joint up. The whole idea here 
is to fill this cavity inside the eyelet, which no matter how well you cram the wire on the eyelet will be empty anyhow, to backfill that with solder. And instead of having a mechanical hydraulic compression fitting, you're gonna also fill this up with an electrical connection. So any electrical resistance that is built up on this portion of the connector is overcome by the conductivity of the electrical connection on this side of the eyelet. <clears throat> now, in theory, if you've done the crimp properly, when you fill up the titty here, the hole, our opening, if we fill that up with flux, and most of it should stay put. We had a little bit run back the wire, but it doesn't matter. That should be almost solid in there if that connection is correct. That's not debatable, that's a fact. When you go and you look at, if you take and you viacate the eyelet and, and cut it in half, you'll find that this is almost completely solid. Now, depending on the wire manufacturer, the size of the strand of the wire, you might end up having a couple little voids in here, but they're micro. But still, this is a mechanical connection. This is an electrical connection, hence resistance, hence loss. Well, because I don't want to have 15 pieces of wire coming up here to the workbench, I'm going to have one. I want to maximize this connection. It's going to be a bolted down fixed location that's not going to move. It doesn't hurt to solder it. You're going to increase the ability of the eyelet's you know, potential of conducting current vastly. Okay. Here we go. Changing perspectives make it a little bit easier for you guys to see. Let's make sure I've got everything still in frame where I want it to be. I do. And away we go. submerged until it quits bubbling out the, the hole. That way we know all the flux is outgassed. We tilt it up. slowly let it cool. Just had something weird happen. This has actually been unfolding all afternoon. Um, I had a guy contact me at O'Crack 30 this morning, which I don't mind. The only day I feel it's ridiculous is like <clears throat> when somebody's got to message me at 4.30 Sunday morning and then they bitch at me about it when I get back to them on Monday. Oh, I'm sorry, man. I had a guy contact me really early this morning and he wanted an update on the status of his repair. And I'm like, sure man, I'm not really quite open yet, but when I get out there, I can go take a look at, you know, give me more information than that. And he was, he's very thorough. He provided me a picture and told me his name and stuff. And he also pointed out to me this, and I don't think I cover this enough. I've sent you multiple messages on Facebook. Okay, I don't use Facebook Messenger for anything. Personally, I look at Facebook as a virus, and especially the last like three weeks, I cannot stand Facebook. I've... All the self-appointed germaphobe experts out there just drive me up the wall. Anyhow, um, so I go on to explain him that I don't use Facebook. I actually have it disabled on my phone and everywhere. I don't even have the app on my phone. I don't, I don't use it for anything at all. So, whoop, whoop, chicken whistle. Whoop, 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 train whistle. Um, he goes on to explain to me that I've had the amps now for quite some time. And what immediately popped into my brain is, I don't know who you are 
because you're just a phone number that popped up on my phone. And this equipment, just because you got pictures of it, I don't, that doesn't mean anything to me other than, okay, now if, here's the sticky part is that he went to a, a CB shop that I do a lot of business with and that's how the repair work ended up coming here. God, that looks good. How's that go? Once you finally, once you're almost done, you've actually finally figured out how to do something really, really right. He, he'd gone to a CB shop I do a lot of business with and that's how the equipment arrived here. So in my mind, I don't have his name, his phone number, none of that contact information. I'm solely working for that CB shop. Okay, um, I'm gonna admit a lot of details here, but <laughs> I told him, I said, well, man, it, uh, I can't. I'd love to get you back your equipment. I'll get it pulled and we'll get it shipped back to you immediately since he didn't want to wait. I told him, yeah, it's gonna be a couple more months, but um, you know, I gotta, I gotta check with my actual customer, which I've had this happen before, and everybody was really cool about it. And you just call and you, you check with the, the feeder shop and you say, hey man, we good to go on this? What's the story? But something was off, because he was like, I want it now, I need it now, I need it right now. And I said, well, yeah. I mean, I'm never going to stand in the way of somebody that wants to get their equipment back. If you want your equipment back, call me. I'm not, you're not going to get any flack from me here. Take it. Go. Um, I'm hurting my feelings, son. I'm not upset. I'm not even mad at the guy after the, the torment that I've been through this entire day. I've, this has probably occupied three hours of my day making sure everybody's stories were straight. Because I don't want to get caught in the middle. I do everything I can in my day to be as transparent with everybody I can on every level that I can. Okay. So I call the CB shop and say, hey, oh man, so-and-so called me this morning, wanting to get an update on his equipment. I told him I couldn't get to it like right away. Currently couldn't work on anything right now. Um, and it'd be a little bit longer. He told me that he wanted his equipment back ASAP where are we at with that? Well, come to find out, a little bit more to the story than just BBI got the equipment. Come to find out there was what they call forwarding charges or an outstanding bill for other things that were going on at that CB shop. Now, I'm not saying that somebody's trying to escape out on a bill. I'm not going into that, and I don't want to make anybody feel bad about this. In the same breath, I did due diligence. As soon as I found out that there was some monies that were owed, I, I look, I'm not a bank, I'm not a collection agency, and I'm not interested in getting involved in those businesses. It's just my job to fix the amplifiers, right? And any time that a situation arises to where it's not straightforward, transparent, crystal clear, and everybody knows what everybody else is doing, and I feel that there's any kind of anything, that makes me feel uncomfortable, I just say no. I, I'm established enough now to where I don't feel I need to be worried about that. And I just say no. I pull straight back, pull out of the situation completely. I return all said devices to the people that sent them here. And I move on with my day. Okay. It's not worth it to me. There's too much stuff that needs to get fixed. There's too many people that I need to try and help. There's too much stuff going on. I don't, I don't need the drama. So I informed him that, you know, he needed to get in contact with the shop, that the equipment was gonna be returned to the shop. That way I can verify who owns it. Once again, I don't know this guy from Adam. He's not my customer, the shop is. Okay, so he says, no, I'll pay you for the shipping. And this other amplifier that was given to me on a loan, I'll send it to you, you can return it to the shop. I was like, no, definitely not. No, 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 definitely not. I gotta reflux, I gotta redo this end. Ah, it's not flowing in the way I want it. But it sure is shiny and pretty. Oh no, 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 that worked perfect. Look at that, oh, it's perfect. Oh, it's perfect, look at this. I'm gonna do this and not burn myself.
like a Xylon's dong. That's cool. That is shiny. They call him Captain, Captain Shiny Helmet. Um, off. In about four hours I'll be able to move that. Um, <clears throat> he was really stuck on wanting me to return the equipment to him and I can't do that. And I, I really honestly feel that I made the right choice. The reason I'm telling you guys about it is, you, gentlemen, don't put me in that position. A CB shop that I've literally done a kajillion dollars worth of business with versus some random phone number that, that is too many red flags. That does, it just doesn't look good all the way around. Think about that. That just looks hinky all the way around. It looks very not legit. So I'm going to do what's best for all parties involved. I'm going to get the equipment back to the shop. Homeboy can go work out his issues with that shop. And now he's all the only thing he's going to be out is maybe a little bit of money for shipping. I just flicked the end and knocked all the solder out of it. Oh my god, that wire's hot. Ah! There's so much more to this than just pushing solder, I swear to god. And every day it's something new. Some new weird twisted facet. <sighs> the reason I gotta make it public record is once again to protect myself, protect my company name. I gotta make it public so you all hear about it. That way if, if homeboy decides he's gonna go down Facebook and whine about it, you're all gonna be like, <laughs> so it is what it is. <sighs> Drama. Well, we're on day number three. I'm freaking out. We're gonna come back to that. So, I gotta show you guys this. <laughs> oh man, these two ring terminals right here. Manual focus there, buddy. These two ring terminals right here have been my positive, I about wore out this eyelet. And I, rightfully so. If you guys had any idea, uh, just to put this in perspective, I'm not going to say that I have, but the theory holds, theory, because I'm not going to say I have or haven't, that would be silly to do on video, but the theory is there's been roughly 3,500-ish ish, um, amps that may or may not have possibly been manufactured or created brought into existence, uh, have been attached to these two ring terminals and somewhere in the order of like 4,000 something repairs. This entire system is desperately needed in an overhaul. Like these are crimped with a hammer. <laughs> Not to standard anymore. We can't, this isn't acceptable. This isn't safe. But this is what I've been running on for a long time. And that's why I'm doing this overhaul. And what started all of this is within, I'd say three weeks, I had every battery on the, on the power supply down there sulfonate. Bad, it's a bad move. So <clears throat> I knew I'd be down, but uh, the realism of the thing is, is that the workbench is completely not working at the moment. And what's holding me up is I'm hung up in my head. Completely frozen my head with how I want to go about tying these together. Now, I built the little clippy things yesterday at the end of a very long 19 hour day. Okay, brain was fried. I just wanted to feel like I was making some forward progression. <laughs> I really did. Yesterday was an up uphill challenge and the smallest thing was the biggest but the smallest thing in the world was trying to get the brass terminals that are inside of these things here the brass terminals um, on top of the batteries I ended up getting like three at one battery shop and two at another and another one at a third shop um, I didn't want to settle and I'm not gonna settle as we go forward I've got a mountain of work sitting here and we're hung up on batteries and what we're going to do in the future. The fourth battery is out there floating around in the digital ether someplace in the back of some truck. 
and I don't know if it shows up today or if it shows up next week, I don't know. I've got to get back up and running. So that means going forward, I have to, uh, I have to plan for the future and do expansion. Now the super capacitor bank that I'm going to build is going to be another whole complete video. That's another whole unique monster all into its own. And the reason I say it's a unique monster is because while well, it's going to be epically large and really cool and custom and kick ass, but um, the caps are back ordered. And that's going to be probably a month or better down the road. I need to get back running. I've got to get the workbench going. So, <clears throat> how do I go about hooking these up? That's the question for in the future and expansion into the going in. And how do I want to do this? Do I want to sum them all together? Do I run them all in series parallel? How do I want to do this? <clears throat> so I'm stuck. I went to sleep thinking about this, woke up dreaming about it. How do I want to put this together? Because I'm tired of making compromises. I'm tired of working on things that are kind of halved, halved and stand out here and talk about doing things whole all the time. So I got to hold myself to the same standard to which I preach. Wait a minute, that's not how professional preachers do it. Hmm. I guess that must mean I'm holding myself to a higher standard. That's interesting. Okay, let me uh, let's let's switch perspectives here real quick. I got these assembled last night. I like them. But there's certain things about this that this whole little section of my workbench I like and I dislike, okay? I kind of like having everything off here in the corner. I don't like having everything so close together. Um, I'm going to modify <clears throat> this pedestal a little bit. You should see the wood underneath the positive side where it's just, it's just chewed out. Um, I read a couple of the comments that were on Facebook. Um, I'm really excited about being able to actually have metal to metal contact underneath those clamps. And then I seen what some of the people put up that were commercial developed distribution plates. I was like, no, that won't work. The thing that we have to have is I have to have the ability to hook up to these terminals any kind of fitting that anybody's got on the ass end of their amp, okay? And how we've done that in the past is with an eyelet, a couple washers, and a screw. Now the reason that we have to have this kind of tensioning system is because if I ever have a situation where something gets out of hand here on the workbench, I have to be able to reach over and physically break the electrical connection quickly and usually on both poles. It's the reason that I've always avoided using these. Because once you have that hard physical connection, that's great if you're committed to something running, but if you're in the process of testing or uh, repairing, sometimes you've got to cut power right away. Like, right now. The amount of current that's going to be behind these terminals it's not, hold on, let me get out my metal conductive wrench. I want to be able to reach over here and go, gimme, and pull it right on out of there, which we can achieve with eyelet to eyelet love and then pull on it. You don't want to commit through this hole. Okay, that's something that you do after you have everything working perfectly. So this is going to get changed. I've had a little more innovation in my brain about what I want to do there. But I do think it is time for me to retire the distribution blocks. They take up a lot of space. Um, I think these are going to go away today. And I think that they're going to go into something else. I've used them, I think, three or four times. And I want to free up this area. And I want to move where this is at. And I want to space space. So where I'm at, let's talk battery hookups. Oh yeah, good tripod. 
Ah, good stuff. So, let's do battery 101 here. All right. Battery 1. We'll say positive is going to run down this side. And negative is going to run down this side. Battery number 2. Battery number 3. Battery number 4. Okay, so how most people would do this is they take positive to positive, positive to positive, positive to positive, okay? Negative to negative, negative to negative, negative to negative, all right? So then you're going to have your charge lead. And then you're going to have your load. Lead. So you've got your positive and negative coming from your power supply. What most guys will do is they'll take their positive lead and they'll go to this terminal on the battery. They're going to take the negative lead and they're going to come around to this terminal on their battery bank. Okay? Now you're going to have you're going to have your positive and your negative coming from the workbench. Well, where this hooks up, this is positive lead comes around. And we hook it up here, and this negative lead we hook it up here. Make sense? The reason we do this. So if we took all of our positives and summed them together on this battery and it had all of these running in a chain and then we hooked our load up here, this battery is constantly going to be dead and then a little bit less dead, then a little bit less dead, and then charged. So we had just the charge leads coming in and then just our load leads attached. Hardly any current is going to get here to charge this battery where if we take and we put the negative lead here, positive lead here, our charge positive and our charge negative, it has to pull through the entire circuit to achieve balance, right? So the equal amount of current going in and coming out has to travel across all the batteries over an equal distance. And that allows us to have an equalized load across all four batteries. Well, <clears throat> let's redraw our diagram. I'll throw a little bit more in on this. So now we're going to have battery number one, number two, number three, number four. Okay. And we'll just say positive this side, negative this side. Terminal, 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 and a terminal. Now, what I got to add to this is going to be six 500 ferret capacitors. So we're going to say one, two, three, four, five, six caps. So caps. These also have positive and negatives on each one of the caps. Now, because the caps, I'm having them send them to me in individual cells. I can build them into almost any shape that I want and have them uh, connected pretty much in any pattern I want. So, I have my bench. All right, so I've got a positive and I've got a negative. And then we're going to have, and I'm up just, just from the standpoint of trying to conserve energy a little bit, we're going to have the 200 amp power supply. So 
so supplies, supplies, in parentheses. We're gonna have a 200 amp and a 1000 amp supply, okay? But then because I've got batteries in the circuit, that means I also have to have bat maintainer. Okay, I have several thousand dollars in batteries now on the workbench. We gotta start taking this seriously instead of just letting them sit here and then slam a ton of current into them. I wanna keep them topped off. And maybe we've invested in a really expensive charger that's got auto desulfonation in it and all kinds of other stuff. So, <clears throat> how do we bring our positive, our negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, plus all the different positive and negative leads from here, plus all the positive and negative leads from here, and still be able to capitalize on being able to pull on the full amount of the capacitor current, full amount of the battery current, and keeping my power in, okay, remember how we set things up, and we do this for a reason, is the load from the workbench must go to the capacitors first, and we want to utilize all of the capacitors together, and then off the capacitors, to maintain the capacitors, we have to have our batteries. So we push our current from our power supplies first to our batteries, then out of our batteries into our caps, and then out of our caps to our workbench. I have to get back up and running. I have to be back up and running by the end of today. But I have to build a plan for these moves and for this in the future with no has assery. No have to ask assery. Pray to Christ that all the time that I'm spent talking to the camera and explaining this is not for nothing. I hope somebody out there someplace if I can help just one person take something vital away from this and allows them to set up either their workbench, their mobile, or some power supply system in the future, if I can help one person with that and they learn one trick or they learn something from this, then all the time and energy of the last three days have gone for a good thing and I won't consider it a loss. So there's a couple ways to do this. We're gonna say load which is the bench. Now, the reason that I'm going this route and not just building a huge, a huge, and I mean huge, power supply is I love the fact that I can turn off all my power supplies and work on just the float voltage of the batteries at 12 volts, and I can use the batteries as a buffer. It, that to me, I'd rather put, if there's gonna be a short or an explosion or anything, I wanna have it at that low voltage, and I'm not gonna lie, I kinda like working in the quiet most of the time. So to have fans running on big switcher supplies and I don't, I don't wanna listen to that all the time. So I enjoy just having a couple batteries hooked up and I can just have my 12.5 volt float voltage, do my, do my base tuning on things and get things kinda situated and then start ramping the voltage up, thus increasing my risk potential incrementally. I feel like I'm a little bit more in control. All of this would be for nothing if I just go out and build like a 2,000 amp multi-stage power supply that I could just reach down and start grabbing sections. I don't want to go that route. Because if you remember, in one of the very first video segments of this entire thing, I said this is going to be a multi-purpose setup. Not only is it going to run the, uh, the, the, the bench, but if my lights go off, I want to be able to utilize these. This is one of multiple Eaton true power sine wave inverters that I have. And I wanna be able to keep my fridges on and I wanna keep my lights on. But I wanna be able to do it for just a little amount of time and do it off the battery bank. So I have to plan on running these as well. These are really cool units, by the way. Um, I have multiple 1800 watt and it's true, 1800 watt continuous duty Eaton supplies, inverters. 
I could go to Harbor Freight and get four 8,000 watt inverters for what I paid for two of those units. Those are true sine wave, and I mean true. I got a video clip of that floating around here. Maybe I should throw that in here now. Clean. I'll put it on a, this little paint stripper. Oh, hundred and some amps worth of load. After a shitty connection there, it's 184 amps worth of load. Very clean. Input voltage. Input current. Initial inrush current is about 150 amps. Clean. Perfectly clean. Perfectly clean. I pray to Christ that all the time that I've spent talking to the camera and explaining this is not for nothing. I hope somebody out there someplace, if I can help just one person, take something vital away from this and allows them to set up either their workbench, their mobile, or some power supply system in the future. If I can help one person with that and they learn one trick or they learn something from this, then all the time and energy of the last three days have gone for a good thing and I won't consider it a loss. So there's a couple ways to do this. We're gonna say load, which is the bench, now, the reason that I'm going this route and not just building a huge, a huge, and I mean huge, power supply is I love the fact that I can turn off all my power supplies and work on just the float voltage of the batteries at 12 volts, and I can use the batteries as a buffer. It, to me, I'd rather put, if there's going to be a short or an explosion or anything, I want to have it at that low voltage, and I'm not going to lie, I kind of like working in the quiet most of the time. So to have fans running on big switcher supplies and I don't, I don't want to listen to that all the time. So I enjoy just having a couple batteries hooked up and I can just have my 12.5 volt float voltage, do my, do my base tuning on things and get things kind of situated and then start ramping the voltage up, thus increasing my risk potential incrementally. I feel like I'm a little bit more in control. All of this would be for nothing if I just go out and build like a 2000 amp multi-stage power supply that I could just reach down and start grabbing sections. I don't want to go that route because if you remember in one of the very first video segments of this entire thing I said this is going to be a multi-purpose setup not only is it going to run the, bat uh, the, the, the bench but if my lights go off I want to be able to utilize these this is one of multiple Eaton true power sine wave inverters that I have and I want to be able to keep my fridges on and I want to keep my lights on but I want to be able to do it for just a little amount of time and do it off the battery bank so I have to plan on running these as well these are really cool units by the way um, of multiple 1800 watt and that's true 1800 watt continuous duty Eaton supplies inverters. I could go to Harbor Freight and get four 8,000 watt inverters for what I paid for two of those units. Those are true sine wave and I mean true. I got a video clip of that floating around here. Maybe I should throw that in here now. So on top of that, those are, that's the upside. That's what I'm trying to achieve. Those are my goals. So we have our workbench load, and then we're just going to say supplies. Okay. Positive, negative, positive, negative. All right. So we have our batteries. One, two, three, four. And then our caps. We're just going to say caps. 
for now, um, for today, to get through the end of today, um, I have two 500 ferret caps. One's uh, Maxwell, the other one is an excess power. I'm going to sum them together and we're going to move on because we're going to have to revisit the cap bank, but to build towards the future. So we have our terminals. We're going to say this is a positive leg, this is a negative leg. They run consistently down the batteries. So do we tie the batteries together in the chain fashion that we just talked about? And then I pull a positive lead off and go to a plate, pull a negative lead off and go to a plate. Or do I run off of each one of the batteries a single committed one on lead to a plate and sum them together at a centralized location, one for positive, one for negative. And then when I bring my caps on board, all I gotta do is bring one committed lead over to a plate and then I can bring my load, which is the workbench lead, to a plate. That way everything travels the exact same distance. Everything receives the same amount of current from the charge supplies and everything receives the same amount of supplemental current from the capacitors. That's one way of thinking. The other way of thinking is this. We have a positive and our negative coming in from our supplies. Then we have our batteries. Okay, so we bring our negative lead in and we hook it up and then we're going to say our negative lead off and so on and so on and so on and so on. Then we bring our positive lead in and so then we'll, we'll say this is going to be our positive lead out, okay? Just because we got it hooked up as a square and then it would be this lead to here and then this lead to over here. Then do I bring my battery, have my battery bank, and then directly over that, we're gonna have our caps. So we bring our positive in, then we have a common bus that goes between all six of the capacitors. One for positive, one for negative. And then bring that out and run that over to our bench. Load. Each one of these has an upside to it, and each one of these has a downside to it. The positive side for this is it completely isolates the batteries, and this is the way I tell everybody to set up their systems in the mobile. So whatever current leaks past your batteries, then supplements your capacitors and charges them, and whatever your load is, is evenly dispersed across our cap bank. Hmm. What's to do, what's to do, what's to do? This version of reality allows me the option to be able to have breakers either on my batteries or on my caps and I can isolate. I can do the same thing here, have isolation and breakers. Or do we do this and then coming off our load source at our bench, we attach our capacitors, which is all the exact same thing, just different ways of laying it out. That is what I went to sleep thinking about. And that is what I woke up this morning dreaming about. How to put this jigsaw puzzle together so I don't have to revisit this again for another 10 years. Instead of just dealing with half to assed architecture as I increase, I just want this to be the last time I have to deal with this. That is my dilemma. Well, I think I'm gonna start here. Um, I've come up with some improvements in my brain that I wanna to do to this already. That and I can't stand to look at this temporary piece of plastic anymore and I want to get rid of this. So 
I'm going to strip this apart, even though I kind of put this all together loosely last night. I'm going to take it apart, change a couple things. We're going to put this back together and get this straight. And then we can go work down below underneath here. So let me rip this apart. Let's make some modifications. Well, as you guys can clearly see, uh, we clean this up quite a bit. I don't feel so, quite so crowded in that corner. I was going to do a clamping system like this for this power supply, but I decided that that's temporary. Um, eventually that's going to get moved down and attached to what I'm working on now. So that being said, this is going to be our primary feed point right here. And I had to color code it and I had to clean it up and I mean, I couldn't believe the amount of filth that was in that corner, just dust from over the years of me doing everything out here, you know? Unbelievable. So, so let's cruise on over here. Let me show you what I figured out. I'm gonna sum the batteries. I'm gonna bring the distribution from the workbench to a plate. And from there, that allows me the most flexibility all the way around. So our primary, four out wire is going to go here right in the middle of the plate and then we're going to attach to that whatever I want so I can have my inverters cap bank radios batteries giving me the option up to five batteries um, each one of the cap leads if you notice I spaced this out a little bit further that allows me to go up to four out here if I want to in the future because um, the caps are going to be what's going to do 90% of the work and at any time, I can seriously just drop down to two leads off the batteries and tie in each one of the individual cap banks. One, two, three, four, five, or six, double up on the odd, or the ox. But this is, uh, and if this can't carry a thousand amps worth of current, Lord help us. That's all I gotta say about that. I'm excited, because I'm finally on the way to being able to get this all put together, and uh, I can be up and running here for the end of the day. This makes me happy. Now, hopefully I don't curse myself, but so far I've managed to do this entire project and not put any holes in my hands or rip my skin open in any way. All right, dear Lord help me, I'm off to the drill press. I want to be done, I want to be done, I want to be done. Da -da 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 -da. Yay! Well, uh, we got these suckers installed. And these two leads here are what feed all my radios. They go up to distribution blocks up here. But this is our 4 out that goes up to the bench. 4 out. So now we just got to run all the uh, run all the eight gauge, and hopefully none of these wires get twisted. You know, pain in the ass to get everything undone underneath here. <clears throat> it's like that freaking knot in your butt hair that just will never come undone. You know. That's all I got to say about that. Okay, I'll be back. This is where I ended up down here. Um, we got one more that we're going to have to add um, for the next battery. And so then we're going to utilize one, two, three, four more of these connections um, for the other caps. And I'm not going to lie, there's kind of part of me that wants to even double down on this. Hmm. Note to self, let's go do a Google search for 8 aught wire. <laughs> Long day. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Shoving my big old fatty, fat ass up in them little tiny holes, making it fit. Okay. So, we're going to assemble capacitor number one. Now, there's got to be five more of these that have to be installed before I call this complete. Okay, the bottom side of this deal 
down there on the floor is looking pretty freaking righteous, in my opinion. So, now all we got to do is assemble the capacitors. Now, we do this just like you're installing, you know, AA batteries in your wife's vibrator. Positive, negative, negative, positive, okay? Now, I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. But we're going to start here. This is going to be our positive terminal. So we're going to go to our negative terminal. I got five of these on back order. I cannot wait to see what this thing does with fresh new batteries on the bench. I have my Chinesium battery tester. Negative. Positive. Okay. I have my 500 amp battery tester, and you mark my words, I'm going to set that son bitch on fire. Although I know the batteries can easily do that, but this, this thing is going to become impressive. Once I get all those capacitors stacked up underneath here, that that is going to be neat. I cannot wait to turn on my system over here and have to wait for 20 minutes as I'm letting the caps charge up because the power supply is having to slowly leak the current. I'm just I'm looking forward to it. All right, so we're add another shorting bar to it. It's this simple, you guys, to build your own caps. The only thing that you're paying the third party company for is to put it in a neat, nice, neatsy little plastic case that is impact insurance rated. So like if you have it in your car and you get in an automobile accident, you don't have to worry about having an explosion. These things are like little bombs are full of bugs of joy. The little magic pixies that want to slide out and just obliterate everything. I freaking love them. I've been waiting for quite a few years to assemble this cap. Titan. Titan. Now, we're going to take our crossover bar go this direction. Dink. Dink. Dig it. We'll dig it, dig it. So let's see. So this is negative. That means this side needs to be positive. I just love the flexibility of these bars that XS has come up with. Because you can mount this thing literally in orienta any orientation. You can make the cap in any shape you want. I'm going to go and put six capacitor banks that look like six packs of beer underneath my bench. That makes me excited. It makes me very excited. This is ironicism at its best, I think. Or this is ironic. very first thing we're going to attach here is going to be the super cap. Yes, sir. Now, there's many different ways to charge this, but they all have the exact same result. You can take your old-timey square buzz box and put it on the lowest setting, 
and let it slowly trickle in that way. Let the electrons weep into the capacitor that way. Or if you buy a pre-made, pre-assembled supercapacitor from XS, them bloody guys are cool enough to send you a little white, a little white light bulb. You just hook up, make sure the light bulb's not laying on anything. It can burn, like I don't know, the towel, and you let it do its, its schmew. It's only going to let a couple amps in at a time, and it's going to slowly fill this thing up. This is like a big bucket of electrons right here. These six caps it has the ability to get rid of it really quick, and it has the ability to inrush it really quick. So as I'm letting that light charge the caps. I gotta backfill this little jumper I just built to hook the cap up to the rest of the circuit. I gotta backfill this with solder and put a heat shrink on it. Yay, almost done. Okay. I am committing the ultimate sin again. I, I like, I'd much rather use my solder pot to do this. It's quicker, it's easier, it does a better joint, but I don't have all afternoon to wait for the pot to heat up again and for it to cool down. There's guys out there, I swear, I don't understand why they're so vehement about this and I feel sorry for them, but they like lose their shit. Soldering end? What, if you crimp it properly, it's completely unnecessary. It's a giant waste of time. Your, your, your man penis is going to turn into a Bruce Jenner and then it's going to run inside and I'm telling mom. It's their mentality. It's like, whoa, calm down. We're just talking about creating a superior electrical connection, vastly superior. Come on, shink in there. Here we go. I don't get it. Especially something that's going to be static like this. And I could get maybe like the joint going to and from your starter motor or the frame or something. You know, there's enough vibration there, but as you can clearly see, if the joint's done properly, the only thing you're filling up with solder is the front edge of this eyelet. And if you let this thing cool down, you don't change the temper of the copper. I mean, you let it cool down nice and slow by air. You're not changing the temper of the copper and you're not work hardening it that awful much. Man, they get on their freaking soapbox. And I take every opportunity to get to do one of these live on video to get on my soapbox and call them out. <laughs> yeah, oh well. That freaking burns. I flipped the lead around, you guys are gonna get kicked out of this. Flipped the lead around and it's just long enough so it's hanging off the edge of the bench, but back this direction. And I go to saunder on up to this thing. Now, if you've met me, you know I'm kind of a little bit of a larger man. I'm working on that very aggressively on an incredibly strict diet. And uh, I was going to the gym twice a day. Um, the coronavirus issue that we're all tackling here today, right now, in the present. Um, the gyms are closed, so I'm having to work out from home. But I I'm trying to get rid of my buta. I'm trying to get rid of my Buddha, put on more muscle mass, be even bigger than I already am. Um, but the eyelet got me right below my navel on my belly. It went underneath my shirt and went. So I have a soldering iron branded underneath my belly now, or the, the eyelet branded underneath my belly button. It freaking hurts. All right, let's solder this up. Wow, this technology works. That's all I'm going to say. and it shines the eyelid up as you pull it out. Oh, that works much better. Oh, that makes me happy. Okay, so this is what we're gonna consider to be adequate at the moment. So, we got aught gauge coming out of our little cramp down connectors. Coming to our very cheesy terminal connectors, but we're going to come over here to the carbon load cell and this isn't really the best way to go about doing this. 
but it's the most colorful in my opinion. So, and, and you know, I don't care. I'm gonna have some fun. This is two days worth of me stressing about shit, three days worth of me stressing about this shit. Let's have a little bit of fun. Okay, so we're on DC. This is our amp gauge. Of course, then we've got this amp gauge here, which is, well, Chinesium, so who knows. Um, you guys that are wearing headphones, turn the volume down. Because this thing goes on to make it a hell of a racket. And I mean a hell of a racket once the load cell gets hot. Hence the reason the Ryobi fan. Here we go. Please note we're above 12, still above 12, still above 12. Still above 12. Oh, just below 12 now. Oh shit, look at this. Friggin' burning up. <laughs> oh. Workbench is on fire. Terminal's on fire. I gotta back off on this. I just set my towel on fire. <laughs> oh my god, that had flames coming out of it. Lit the towel on fire, everything. I think the metallurgy on the clamp's now bad. Ooh. I love it. I love it. It makes me happy. So back here at the clamps, there's zero heat. All of our current restriction was right here. So that meter, I don't even know if the voltage is reading accurately because, well, I've got it covered up in my fan, but amp gauge is pretty close. And nothing down below is even hot. If I wouldn't have known I just did that, you would have never known. Looking at it thermo with a thermometer, a therm uh, thermometer. That's 600 plus degrees on the ground side. It's 190. So most of our current limitation is, well, the Chinese clamp and the lack of surface area. Oh yeah, shitty cheap China wire. Limp noodle. <laughs> yeah, piss on it. According to the amp gauge, it's 630 amps that's getting pulled. We're seeing 300 and something here. 300 and something there. <laughs> oh well. Okay. Enough randomly just destroying shit for no reason. So you guys might have thought that test was actually pointless. And what you're seeing is hot spots is actually just infrared reflections. There's absolutely nothing hot down here whatsoever. So you actually go straight on it. There's no heat. No heat more infrared reflections. Straight on it, no heat. So, it makes me happy. The test was for a reason. Okay, so, 
I want to max this out and let it cook. I've got every bit of current going to that plate that I can muster up on the on the on the bench at the moment. Um, we modified our little clips. We added braid that goes. The way this was originally set up is I had it set up so that only the, the bottom plate was connected and the top plate was just going to float. Maybe pick up a little bit from the screw. I went ahead and I added one inch wide ground strap. I soldered it to the plate, soldered it to the bottom plate. Same thing on the negative side. So we're going we're gonna to hit this like there's no tomorrow. It's hard. It's like Tyler Durden said in Fight Club. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Now, the variable that we're going to have is because the way these things are put together, they got a rubberized coating on them, or otherwise I'd have them going directly to the clip. Where we're going to have our most current restriction is going to be here, but our, the absolute max is going to be right here. The lack of clamp ability. There's not any pressure, there's no surface tension there. We're just relying on these two little springs. So, we're going to get this son bitch hot. Let's see what happens. There's 100 amp, 200 amp, 400 amp, 500 amp. Pegged off the scale. Now the load cell starts to heat up and that's why this is backing off. Eight hundred amps is what it's showing here. Four hundred and ninety-five here. This is starting to smoke. That's starting to smoke. This thing's on fire. I'm on fire. <laughs> the wire inside is what caught on fire. Needless to say, we have the ability to go above and beyond the call of duty. The voltmeter is messed up. Look at this. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's freaking funny. <laughs> we set it on fire. That's all that matters. I'm happy now. needed to do was put like a 400 500 amp load up here so I could measure down there to make sure that none of my connections and my distribution plate my terminals on my battery the terminals on the super caps all that kind of stuff were loose or if they needed to be any bigger which the end result is no we're good well I want to get a little bit more 4 gauge wire or 4 aught and redo a couple of the junctions here and I cannot wait for the super caps to come in but that's going to be on another video at another time well guys I'm gonna run it's been a long couple days I'm gonna go see my wife and see what she's doing and hang out with her for a little while and then I get to come back out here throw this towel in the garbage and get to go back to work well, gentlemen, I hope somebody out there learned something, a little bit of something from this. I hope that we all took away a little bit of knowledge of some kind. I absolutely detest laying on the floor and rolling around. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So, this is a, a labor of love for me, but that is what makes this workbench run underneath the bench. And there's more to come on this. I've got another battery I've got to add when it gets here. And like I said, five more super caps. So that'll be a part two on this continued here in a month or so once the caps actually get here. I'm not going to totally dink around with this. This is big enough for me to run off of for a little while. So on that note, gentlemen, I'm going to run. Thank you all very much. And I thank you for tuning in and watching. I thank you for giving me a thumbs up every once in a while. I appreciate you guys. If, I have a, if I'm looking for a rare unobtainium part, you guys always manage to come through. Um, I did the video, the, the YouTube video here the other day, and I'll be damned, I got three of them damn swing chokes sitting over here now. 
everybody and their brother just helped me out tremendously with that. And I want to give big thanks to everybody. I appreciate every single one of you guys. Remember, this is an interactive hobby where we've got to be here to help each other, support each other, take care of each other. Because uh, radio is an awfully lonely place. If you don't have anybody out there to talk to, I'll see you gentlemen. Bye-bye.